It's a vast pottery army which is slowly being unearthed from the tomb where it's lain for more than 2,000 years. When you think of ancient armies carved from clay, China's terracotta army likely springs to mind. But Cyprus, a gem in the Mediterranean, has its very own mysterious terracotta army that could rival the famed army of Qin Shi Huang. Who were these enigmatic warriors? And what does their existence reveal about Cyprus's role in ancient history? Join us as we delve into this captivating mystery, unraveling the secrets behind Cyprus's terracotta warriors and how they rival China's army of Qin Shi Huang. Cyprus's Ancient Hidden Treasure Nestled in the heart of the Carinia district, the charming village of Agia Irini, also called Akdenas, is a peaceful and calm spot under the de facto control of the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. While today it may seem like an ordinary quiet village, Agia Irini holds within its borders one of the most incredible archaeological discoveries of the 20th century, the Cypriot Terracotta Army. This fascinating story begins back in 1929 when the Swedish Cyprus expedition, led by a determined archaeologist named Einar Gerstadt, set out to uncover the secrets of Cyprus's ancient past. Their quest brought them to this quaint village, where they stumbled upon an ancient sanctuary buried for centuries beneath the soil. Little did they know that the discovery they were about to make would not only shock the archaeological community, but would also capture the imagination of people around the world. As they carefully dug deeper into the earth, they unearthed something extraordinary. More than 2,000 terracotta figures, each crafted with incredible detail. These statues, which had been resting in the sanctuary, seemed frozen in time, waiting to be rediscovered. The figures varied in size and form, from small, intricate figurines to life-sized statues. The site had remained untouched for thousands of years until fate intervened, thanks to the sharp eyes of a local priest named Papa Procopios. He played a pivotal role in the discovery when, one day, he caught a looter digging in his field. The looter had unearthed a fragment of a terracotta statue, and instead of ignoring it, Papa Procopios took it to the Nicosia Museum, hoping it might be of historical importance. His instincts were correct. The statue fragment caught the eye of Einar Gierstad, who immediately recognized its significance and led the expedition to the village of Agia Irini. The ancient sanctuary contained a vast collection of terracotta figures, varying in size from small figurines to life-sized statues. These figures, believed to represent warriors, animals, and gods, were carefully arranged around an altar, as if guarding the sacred space. The sheer number and diversity of the figures were astonishing, and they provided a glimpse into the religious and cultural practices of ancient Cyprus. The figures were crafted with remarkable skill, displaying intricate details in their armor, weapons, and facial expressions. The terracotta figures were arranged fascinatingly, as if they were performing in an ancient theater. Some were lying down, others were standing tall, and together they formed a grand semicircle. The scene they created was lively and full of characters from different walks of life. There were priests, warriors, animals, and everyday people, each captured in a moment of action. Some of them appeared to be making offerings, while others were caught in the middle of a dance or playing musical instruments, bringing the entire space to life. Some of the warriors were depicted wearing helmets and carrying shields, while others held spears and swords, ready for battle. The animals, too, were exquisitely rendered, with horses, bulls, and birds, represented among the terracotta army. Among the figures, there were also chariots, pulled by finely crafted horses and sturdy bulls. The statues themselves came in all shapes and sizes, with the largest one being life-sized, towering over the rest. One particularly interesting figure was that of a sacrificial priest. He was dressed in a long robe, with a turban resting on his head, giving him an air of importance. According to the archaeologists, this priest was likely holding a sacrificial knife in his raised left hand, 
poised as if preparing for a sacred ritual. The details of his posture and clothing made it clear that he played a crucial role in the spiritual life of the people who once worshipped at this sanctuary. The scene was not just a collection of statues. It was a vivid snapshot of an ancient world filled with devotion, ritual, and everyday life. Scholars believe that these figures were offerings to the gods, placed in the sanctuary as a form of devotion and protection. The discovery of the Cypriot terracotta army not only shed light on the religious practices of ancient Cyprus, but also raised intriguing questions about the island's connections to other cultures. The craftsmanship of the figures suggests influences from the wider Mediterranean world, particularly Greece and the Near East. The figure's similarity to the famous terracotta army of China has also sparked debate among scholars, though there is no direct evidence linking the two cultures. Sanctuary of Agia Irene. Archaeologists discovered that the Agia Irene sanctuary wasn't built all at once. Instead, it went through many stages of construction and rebuilding over the years. In the early days, the sanctuary was a simple yet impressive structure built to honor the gods who were believed to protect the crops, animals, and the people's way of life. It was a complex of rectangular houses, each constructed with mud-brick walls set on solid stone foundations made of rubble. These houses were isolated, positioned along the sides of a large open courtyard, giving the entire site a feeling of calm and sacredness. The western and northern houses were likely used by the priests who lived there and stored essential items for the rituals and daily activities. These priests played a crucial role in maintaining the sanctuary, keeping the gods' favor, and protecting the abundance of the land. Meanwhile, the central and southern houses had a more divine purpose. The central house, in particular, stood as the heart of the sanctuary, where the primary religious rituals took place. This house had two rooms, filled with sacred objects that provided a glimpse into the ancient practices of the cult. Among these objects were offering tables, large pithoi for storage, bowls, libation vases, a stone cult axe, and a striking terracotta bull. The presence of these objects gave the archaeologists a strong impression that the cult was agrarian, dedicated to worshipping deities who watched over the crops, livestock, and the people's prosperity. The offerings made to these gods were likely products of the land, grains, wine, olives, honey, and vegetables, all symbolic of the community's livelihood. It is believed that these items, along with other votive offerings, were presented to the gods in hopes of ensuring fertility and abundance. The archaeologists, however, did not uncover the main cult object, the sacred symbol of the deity being worshipped. Yet they speculated that the deity may have been represented by a bull, a symbol closely associated with fertility and strength. This would explain the terracotta bull found in the central house, which could have been a representation of the god itself. It's possible that the original cult object was either destroyed or removed during a later period. In the later sanctuary, an oval stone, known as a beetle, served as the cult object. This sacred stone could have been the central object of worship in the earlier sanctuary as well, later moved when the new sanctuary was erected. As time passed, the old sanctuary was covered with red earth, and a new one was built atop it. The design of this newer sanctuary differed greatly from the original. Instead of the enclosed, roofed houses and structures that had once dominated the area, the new sanctuary was an open-air temenos with an irregular shape, surrounded by a wall of red earth known as a paribolos. At the center of this open space, a low altar was constructed near a libation table where offerings were made. During this period, most of the votive offerings were terracotta figures of bulls placed around the altar as symbols of the fertility cult. Layers of ash, Carbonized remains and animal bones were found covering the altar, leading archaeologists to conclude that blood sacrifices had become a part of the ritual practices during the geometric period. These sacrifices likely reflected the cult's continued focus on fertility, with the bull deity remaining central to their worship. 
As the sanctuary evolved through time, new changes took place. More rooms were built and the Peribolos walls were raised higher, giving the sanctuary a more imposing presence, and a new rectangular pillar was built as the main altar. The old terracotta votive offerings, including the bulls, were moved to a deposit near the new altar. However, the types of offerings began to shift. Alongside the familiar animal figurines, new forms emerged, such as statuettes of minotaurs and human figures. Some of these figures, particularly the bulls and minotaurs, featured snakes slithering along their necks and backs, further reinforcing the symbolism of fertility within the cult. During this time, the worship of the deity also began to take on a more anthropomorphic form. Human statuettes, possibly representing the worshippers themselves, started to appear. The inclusion of armed figures and chariots suggested that the god worshipped was not only linked to fertility, but had also become associated with war. This duality of roles reflects the complexity and evolving nature of the religious practices at Agia Irene, where the people's prayers for abundant harvests intertwined with their desires for protection and strength in battle. Rise, Fall, and Rediscovery During the middle of the Cypro-Archaic I period, a new sacred temple, or Temenos, was constructed on top of the old one, in Agia Irene. Even though a fresh layer was added to the sanctuary, the religious practices carried on just as before. The offerings, or votives, that were placed in the old sanctuary were carefully moved to this new one, ensuring that the traditions continued uninterrupted. This time marked the golden era of the Agia Irene sanctuary. While the altar remained the same, the area around it was expanded, making room for a bigger sanctuary. To enclose this larger sacred space, a new perimeter wall, or peribolos, was built. Two additional buildings were constructed in the southern part of the sanctuary, which were believed to house sacred trees, much like those found in Minoan religious sites. One of the most fascinating aspects of this period is the discovery of figures wearing bull masks. Archaeologists believe these figures could represent priests, suggesting that at least some of the rituals performed at the sanctuary might have involved priests dressed as bulls. The presence of numerous small figurines holding tambourines and flutes indicates that music played an essential role in the religious ceremonies at Agia Irene. The votives, mainly terracotta statues of various sizes, were arranged around the altar in a semicircular pattern. The smallest statues were placed closest to the altar, while the larger ones stood in the back, creating a stunning visual display. A notable exhibit from the Cyprus exhibitions at Medelhavsmusit displays these terracotta sculptures, along with a significant stone artifact, or betel, from Agia Irene. At the beginning of the Cypro-Archaic II period, the sanctuary faced several challenges. Floodwaters swept over the site, covering it with layers of sand and gravel. Although this caused some damage, the religious practices soon resumed. However, the floods persisted, striking the sanctuary again and again. By the time the final phase of the Cypro-Archaic period rolled around, around 510 to 500 BC, the sanctuary was hit by a catastrophic flood that forced its abandonment. Centuries later, during the first century BC, there was a brief revival of the cult at Agia Irene. This resurgence, however, was much smaller and poorer than the grand cult that had once flourished there. Few remains from this revival have been found. Eventually, a small church dedicated to Aya Irini, or Holy Peace, was built on the site, further marking the passage of time. In modern times, the sanctuary fell into obscurity and became nothing more than a field. It wasn't until Papa Procopios, a local priest, realized that the corn he had been growing in his field had been planted atop ancient terracotta sculptures that the sanctuary's existence was rediscovered. Across the valley from the sanctuary lies a necropolis with rock-cut tombs. The earliest of these tombs date back to the Cypro-geometric period, while the most recent ones are from Roman times. 
Further down, near the sea, lie the ruins of a small ancient town. The earliest identifiable artifacts from this area date back to the Hellenistic period, adding yet another layer of historical depth to this fascinating region. Late Bronze Age Pottery In the sanctuary at Agia Aerini, archaeologists made another fascinating discovery, pottery from the Late Bronze Age. These finds are especially important because they not only help to trace the early activity at the site, but also allow for comparisons with nearby locations, such as the sanctuary of Metopi Kitharian, just a few kilometers east of Agia Erini. Though late Bronze Age pottery makes up less than 10% of the total artifacts unearthed during the excavation, its presence is still significant. Most of the pottery from this period was found in the cult house, specifically in rooms five and six. Smaller amounts were also discovered beneath the so-called touch layer in the Bronze Age stratum. While these findings aren't completely clear, they do give researchers a good idea of how Bronze Age ceramics were spread out across Agia Erini. Notable among the pottery are base ring jugs and plain white wares from period one, which were well represented. One of the key takeaways from the research is that the variety of Bronze Age pottery at Agia Erini is much greater than previously believed. This diversity suggests that the early history of the site might need some revision. Some experts have dated the earliest phase of Agia Erini to the late Cypriot III period, around 1200 BC. However, the presence of pottery indicates that there may have been occasional activity at the site even earlier. Although the documentation of cultic activity is a complex task, the evidence of pottery hints that the site could have been in use during earlier periods. The oldest artifacts discovered so far are two rim fragments from a red-on-black bowl, dating to the end of the Middle Cypriot III period, around 1600 BC. This discovery is significant not only because of its age, but also due to what it reveals about the distribution of pottery across Cyprus. Typically, red-on-black pottery is found in the eastern part of the island, particularly in the Carpus Peninsula, and in the earliest layers of Encomi. However, it is much rarer in the western part of Cyprus. The fact that these red-on-black shards were found at Agia Irini sheds new light on the movement of goods and cultural exchange across the island. Most of the other Bronze Age pottery found at Agia Irini is in the late Cypriot style. One type of pottery that is particularly well known from this period is white slip ware which was widely used and traded across Cyprus. Interestingly, no white slip ware has been found at Agia Erini so far, which raises questions about the nature of trade and cultural influence in the region during the Late Bronze Age. These discoveries at Agia Erini continue to reshape our understanding of the site and its role in the broader Bronze Age history of Cyprus. With each new find, Archaeologists are gaining a clearer picture of how this ancient sanctuary fits into the cultural and religious landscape of the island, and what connections it may have had with other communities, both near and far. A Historic Archaeological Divide The Swedish Cyprus expedition that uncovered the Cypriot terracotta army turned out to be one of the most significant archaeological endeavors of its time. Over four years of meticulous work, the team unearthed an incredible 18,000 objects, each carefully excavated and recorded. This treasure trove of artifacts was unlike anything seen before and still serves as a foundational pillar for archaeological research in Cyprus. Even today, it remains one of the most well-documented and important collections from the island. In 1931, about two-thirds of these remarkable finds made their way to Stockholm. The sheer volume and significance of the artifacts laid the groundwork for the establishment of the Medelhavsmuseet, the Museum of Mediterranean and Near Eastern Antiquities, in 1954. The museum's collection became one of the most comprehensive representations of Cypriot culture outside of Cyprus itself. However, dividing the vast number of discoveries between Sweden and Cyprus proved to be a complex and delicate task. 
With so many valuable artifacts and tomb groups discovered, both nations had a vested interest in preserving the integrity of the archaeological contexts. After long discussions, both sides agreed that groups of finds from the same tomb or deposit should remain intact, either in Cyprus or Sweden. The Swedes would receive a broad and representative collection of various objects, while the most unique items were to stay in Cyprus. But despite the good intentions and carefully laid out rules, there were moments when things didn't go as planned. One notable example was the division of the terracotta figures and figurines. Although these items came from the same deposit, they ended up being split between the two countries. Half of these extraordinary pieces were sent to Sweden, while the other half remained in Cyprus. This was a departure from the original agreement, but it was one of the compromises made during the distribution process. Sweden ultimately acquired around 12,000 of the 18,000 artifacts, making up two-thirds of the expedition's total finds. This included a significant portion of the scientific material, which was essential for research. Along with the terracotta figures, Sweden also received thousands of boxes containing pottery fragments, hundreds of thousands of pieces in total. These materials now form the heart of the Cypriot collection at the Medelhavsmuseet in Stockholm, with smaller pieces also distributed across other institutions in Sweden. The Swedish expedition not only enriched the cultural heritage of Cyprus, but also added immense value to Sweden's historical collections. Today, the artifacts continue to inspire researchers and museum goers alike, offering a window into the ancient world and the shared history between Cyprus and Sweden. Now it's time for today's subscriber pick. When a routine excavation in Cyprus uncovered what seemed to be a lost army, no one expected it to rival the famed army of Qin Shi Huang. The world buzzed with excitement as news spread about this incredible find, christened the mystery of Cyprus's terracotta army rivals, China's army of Qin Shi Huang. Dr. Elena Papadopoulos, leading the excavation team, marveled at the site before her. An expansive pit was filled with thousands of terracotta warriors, their faces strikingly detailed and their poses as if frozen amid battle. But what truly captivated her was the eerie similarity to the famed Chinese terracotta army. How had such a grand army of clay soldiers come to rest on this sun-soaked island? Digging deeper, Dr. Papadopoulos and her team unearthed a hidden chamber beneath the soldiers. Inside, they discovered ancient scrolls that detailed a forgotten Cypriot king's desperate measures to safeguard his kingdom. According to the scrolls, this king had ordered the creation of an army of terracotta warriors, hoping to protect his realm from invaders. Yet, as time wore on, the kingdom fell into obscurity, and the king's monumental effort was buried with him. The discovery was more than just a historical revelation. It was a thrilling connection between distant civilizations. The enigma of Cyprus's terracotta army, echoing the grandeur of China's, captivated imaginations worldwide. It reminded everyone that history's most extraordinary stories often lie hidden beneath the surface, waiting to be unearthed and celebrated. A Comparative Look While the terracotta army of China's first emperor, Qin Shi Huang, has long fascinated the world with its sheer scale and grandeur, there is another remarkable collection of ancient clay figures that deserves equal attention the Cypriot Terracotta Army. Although less well-known, the Cypriot figures offer a captivating glimpse into the beliefs and customs of ancient Cyprus. What sets the Cypriot Terracotta Army apart is its impressive scale. At Agia Eirini, over 2,000 statues have been uncovered, with researchers suggesting that future discoveries could potentially rival or even surpass the number of figures found in Qin Shi Huang's Grand Mausoleum. Another fascinating aspect of the Cypriot figures is their diversity. Unlike the more uniform and regimented appearance of the Chinese terracotta army, the statues from Cyprus show a wide range of features and poses. This variety highlights the rich local traditions and cultural practices of ancient Cyprus, 
capturing a unique snapshot of their society. Additionally, the sanctuary at Agia Irene offers a dynamic historical narrative. Over 700 years, it evolved from a site focused on fertility rituals to a center dedicated to warrior cults. This evolution provides valuable insight into how cultural and political changes shaped ancient Mediterranean civilizations. In contrast, the Chinese terracotta army primarily reflects the unchanging legacy of Qin Shi Huang's power and control. Excavations at Agia Irini are continually unveiling new and exciting discoveries, capturing the imagination of both scholars and the general public. Recently, the site has benefited from extensive preservation efforts. The Cypriot government, along with international partners, has been working diligently to protect this extraordinary piece of cultural heritage. As the archaeological work advances, researchers are optimistic that new findings will offer deeper insights into the elaborate rituals, beliefs, and military traditions of ancient Cyprus. Discoveries of additional figurines, architectural elements, and other artifacts could help build a fuller picture of the sanctuary's significance within the wider Mediterranean cultural and historical landscape. Furthermore, the Agia Irini site holds great promise for sparking new research and fostering collaboration across various fields. Archaeologists, historians, anthropologists, and experts in material science and conservation are coming together to explore this ancient Mediterranean treasure. By unlocking the secrets of the Cypriot Terracotta Army, these efforts may dramatically reshape our understanding of the region's rich and complex cultural heritage. Echoes of Eternity The sanctuary at Agia Irini, where the Cypriot Terracotta Army was unearthed, remains one of the most remarkable and important archaeological treasures in all of Cyprus. It stands as a silent witness to the island's deep historical roots, captivating archaeologists and visitors alike. Meanwhile, far to the east, within Vietnam's Marble Mountains, another awe-inspiring sight, Huyen Kong Cave, carries an air of mystery as mystical as its name. Huyen Kong Cave is a breathtaking natural wonder formed over countless years by the gentle yet powerful forces of water and time. Nestled within the towering marble mountains, its vast chambers are filled with an almost otherworldly ambiance, where the dance of light and shadow creates an atmosphere that feels sacred and timeless. The cave's limestone walls have been decorated with the spiritual symbols of both Buddhism and Taoism reflecting the deep religious reverence the site has commanded for generations. One of the cave's most remarkable features is the way its natural beauty was intertwined with human craftsmanship. Long ago, artisans used the cave's natural formations as a foundation for their work, carving altars, statues, and other religious figures directly into the rock. The cave's main chamber, in particular, is an impressive sight a large opening at the top allows sunlight to pour in, illuminating the stone carvings and casting a golden glow over the space, which only adds to its mystical atmosphere. The exact origins of Huyen Kong Cave are lost to history, but we know that it has been a site of spiritual importance for centuries. It has served as a sanctuary for both Buddhists and Taoists since at least the 17th century. Legends abound telling stories of saints and sages who sought refuge within its chambers, retreating from the world to meditate and seek enlightenment. These ancient tales only deepen the cave's sense of mystery and draw spiritual seekers and pilgrims from across the world. Many of the religious structures within the cave are believed to have been built during the Tran Dynasty, which ruled Vietnam from the 13th to the 17th century. Over the years, Huyen Kong Cave has housed a variety of inhabitants, including monks who have lived in its depths and soldiers who sought shelter there during times of war. During the Vietnam War, the cave took on a different role, serving as both a sanctuary and a hospital, where locals found refuge from the ongoing conflict. During such turbulent times, the cave remained a place of peace, offering protection and solace to those in need. The craftsmanship within the cave, 
is a marvel of human ingenuity. By blending their work with the cave's natural structure, the builders created an environment that is both serene and awe-inspiring. Altars and statues were carved directly into the limestone, enhancing the cave's spiritual atmosphere while preserving its organic beauty. Throughout history, the cave has also played a role in significant events, from hosting strategic meetings to providing refuge during battles. Yet, despite its occasional use in times of war, Huyan Kong Cave has always been primarily a place of tranquility. Today, Huyan Kong Cave is part of the larger Marble Mountains complex, recognized as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It stands as a lasting testament to Vietnam's rich cultural and spiritual history, embodying the nation's deep connection to its past, its artistry, and its spiritual traditions. Visitors continue to flock to the cave, drawn by its serene beauty and the promise of spiritual reflection in a place where history and nature converge. Architectural wonders abound in the cave, where visitors are greeted by detailed carvings resembling the Cypriot terracotta army. The statues inside the cave depict a range of deities and religious figures, each crafted with remarkable precision. These figures are not just art, they embody the deep faith and spiritual practices of those who once visited the cave. Adding to the cave's charm are the inscriptions and poems left by pilgrims throughout the centuries. These messages, carved into the rock, offer a glimpse into the heartfelt devotion of past visitors and serve as a testament to the cave's inspiring presence. The cave's religious structures are built from local stone, selected for its sturdiness and natural beauty. This choice of material not only enhances the cave's aesthetic appeal, but also contributes to its lasting durability. Over the years, the cave has been carefully maintained and preserved, ensuring that its rich historical and spiritual heritage remains intact for future generations to admire and explore. Can Cyprus's terracotta army rival China's in scale and significance, offering a new perspective on ancient cultures? Let us know your opinion in the comments below.